machine was installed, end to end, 450 something jobs were eliminated. Yes, why? Technology. The efficiency that technology brings into businesses is eliminating human need. What does that tell us? We need to create more businesses in order to create more jobs. Some of you get into the labor market. That is the truth. Jobs are changing so much. The, the richest and biggest companies in the world right now did not exist 10, 12 years ago. The degrees are great, but your talent is far more useful. The degree only says you have been to the four walls of a school. It means nothing. Because it's only how you apply the knowledge of the degree to your skills in order to create value. That's what earns you return. So you can have 20 degrees and go hungry for life. Because nobody really cares about your certificate. It's how you can deliver value. That's why sometimes people finish first degree, they immediately want a master's and a PhD. Good for you. But the guy who went to work right after a first degree and has three, four years working experience will get a job faster than you. Because your master's degree is just another paper. But his working experience is knowledge learned, processes already at the edge to, value he can deliver on day one. When he gets the job, he knows what to do. When you get the job, even with your master's, you're just going to start the learning process. So you need to... For this generation, you need to change your mindset. Entrepreneurship is about creating, creatively creating solutions for challenges that you see in a way that you can economically make it viable so people are willing to pay for what you do. So it's not about what you do specifically. It's how you do it and how relevant it is, how useful it is, what value it creates so that somebody else is willing to pay for it. So for you guys, it doesn't, your father can be telling you that uh, I want my daughter to be a doctor. Good, if that's what you really want to be. But how do you know that we'll really need so many physical doctors in the future? True. If you are watching a lot of what is going on right now in development, you'll find out that there are many things human beings want to do that robots can do. There are many processes that instead of having so many specialists, diagnostic systems become the specialist. So it's a different world. That's the first thing to learn. And except you're globally aware and you're aware of your environment, by the time you think you prepare yourself for something, it's already outdated. So you need to educate yourself. And instead of spending a lot of time on the internet reading stuff that is useless, gossip, story, Kardashian, and any of those stupid things that add no value to you, spend your time searching for trends, looking for opportunities, see what is emerging, watch discovery channels, watch science development, watch all sort of research and innovation that is good. There are hotels in the world that already, there are no, what do they call them, receptionists and all of that. Why? Robots check you in and they serve you in the rooms. Your, the room service is already a robotic system. Why? They don't get tired. They don't fall ill. They're perfectly efficient. And so the guy doesn't have to worry. The hotel owner knows that they will deliver 24-7. When you go into warehouses that do a lot of service trade before, and you would have a lot of people that are pickers from stock in order for orders to be fulfilled, there are many factories right now that do not have anybody there. The guys who produce your iPhone, they have a factory in China that has that by setting up that factory with robots, they eliminated one million jobs. True. Live and real. I didn't, I'm not saying these things to scare you. I'm saying this to prepare your mind. Because you cannot be successful as an entrepreneur into the future. Whether as an entrepreneur within an organization which is called an entrepreneur, or as a, an entrepreneur building your own business, except you understand what the global trends are. Except your mind is thinking ahead of the curve. 
And so don't narrow your mind to Ibadan and think, ah, Nibadan, what's he laju to here? All it takes is one person, Toti Laju, to come into Ibadan with a solution that eliminates your own business. So don't, don't even think that, oh, I'm safe here. It will take a long time. I live in Oshobo. I live in Oshun. It just means that you can be eliminated quickly. Because what you don't know that somebody else knows will make that person shine. And you will look like old school. So open your mind. We need to raise a lot of entrepreneurs because we need to create jobs. But we need smart entrepreneurs because the entrepreneurs of the future won't necessarily employ 10,000 people, 1 million people. Human beings have become less important than they were in the scheme of production. So we need to be thinking quickly about how to retrain human beings in areas where they cannot be ignored. And that's why it's important for you guys to think about your careers. What kind of things you want to do. And take time to open your mind to the world. Now, I'm not going to repeat a lot of stuff that a uh, learned uh, friend already did. Because I think he, he did a good job in laying a foundation in terms of entrepreneurship. I listened to some of what he said, and I know that he covered some of the fundamentals. He gave you the legal framework and all of that. And what we were, you were talking about starting small. See, starting small is, there are many things to it. Every business idea that you have is based on assumptions. You know what assumptions are? You assume that this will be acceptable as a solution to this problem by the people who need it. You assume that the people who need it will be willing to pay this price for this service. You assume that enough people will be willing to buy to make that business sustainable. You assume many things. So your best business plan in the world is a document of assumptions. Now, the challenge with assumptions is they can prove to be right or they can prove to be wrong. They are subject to proof. And always after the fact. Because it means it is after you've made the assumption and sometimes after you have made the investment that you will find some of your assumptions to be wrong. Now, starting small gives you a perfect opportunity to prove your assumptions. Because your cost outlay for a small version of what you want to do is less. And therefore, when you start to test out the assumptions you have made, when you discover some to be wrong, which might be critical to the business, your exposure is not high enough for you to be intimidated and have to shut down the business. You get a chance to correct your assumptions at a lower cost than if you'd already invested a lot of money in a business and you prove to be wrong. It might be a great idea with just a little tweaking, but if you've invested a lot of money in the direction of a wrong assumption, you're likely to be intimidated and give up on a good business. Somebody else will pick it up, correct the errors you made, they will succeed at it, and you'll be wondering why. It's why it's important, first, for a business, do your homework. Don't get consumed by your emotion. Ah, I believe in this. You can believe in it. But because it is your own vision, you can be blind to many things around it. It's why it's important that you do a simple thing called a SWOT test. And that you're honest with yourself. That you are honest with yourself. What does a SWOT test represent? You test the strength. Write down. Always. Don't do it all on your head. Write it down. Write down all the strengths of your idea as you see it and as other people see it. You must learn to be open-minded enough to listen to other people. Some don't like to do that because they don't like to be criticized. Unfortunately, you will die in your ignorance if you don't want other people 
to freely give you their opinion. So, test the strengths, list the strengths. But everything that has a strength also has a weakness. And if you are honest about the strength, don't get carried away with just the strength. You must then list the weaknesses of your business idea. It's not so that you don't go ahead with the business. It's so that once you can identify the weaknesses, you can then find how to solve the problems that the weaknesses represent. Then after that, you determine what are the opportunities within this idea that you have. Because sometimes the opportunities might exist, but does the opportunity exist in enough quantity for you to call it a business? Something that you want to do might be something that your friends and your family like. But are your friends and your family enough for you to do that business consistently? I've been in business for almost 30 years. So if at 25 going on 26 when I started my business, my friends and my family were happy to buy furniture that I made, that would have been good. But how many pieces can they buy and for how long? When you buy a piece of furniture, you use it for many years. So obviously, my friends and my family can never be enough circle for me to sell to. So it's important that the opportunity that it represents, I must be able to determine the quantum and see if that quantum is worthy of the investment of resources and money and time that I need to make. And I must make an honest assessment because a business might succeed in Lagos and you look at Ibadan and you think it will succeed in Ibadan. But it might not succeed in Ibadan because just the difference of nature, the difference of the environment, the difference of the habits and the ways of the different kinds of people might make it work, not work. Pure water sells very well in Lagos. Why? Why? You know, Ibadan has population as well. So if I use population, what did you say? Traffic. That's, like, that's really what made pure water popular. That's what made it successful in Lagos. It wasn't about population. Because Ibadan has a large population. So it's not about, Kano has a lot of people. But what is the difference? It's traffic. It's because people in many years ago, Lagos is a little better now, but it still has those problems. Traffic in Lagos means you sit in it for hours on end. And if you are in public transport, you're hot, you're uncomfortable, after a while, naturally, you will thirst for water. You cannot get out of the bus to go and buy the water. You need people. So some people saw the opportunity that traffic presented and realized that selling stuff to people while they're seated for hours on end in slow moving traffic is as good as having a high traffic supermarket. There are guys who sell in traffic, who will sell 10 times what people with fancy supermarkets sell. They make a lot of money. Don't ever underestimate what they do. There are companies who import goods with the mindset of traffic. Why? They need goods that are light to carry, easy to sell in traffic. That's what they do. They don't sell it, but they feed the guys who sell. And for most of them, they give them credit. You go into the warehouse, you can pick a box, deposit something. They, they'll let you go and sell it because they know you will sell quickly. Once you sell, you come back, you pay. You pay another deposit and pick another box. There are business models built around it. So being an entrepreneur is about finding the unique, innovative solutions, solving problems you can see around you. And sometimes it's not about solving a problem. It's about taking an opportunity. Because what traffic presented in Lagos was a sitting crowd of people who will never get to their house on time to go shopping. So in traffic, some people can buy everything they need to cook stew. They can do all the shopping for their children's school. Exercise, book, pen, biro, anything you want. As long as it's light, easy to carry. People do their shopping in traffic. And they know which area to buy what. So they don't plan to get out. That's our own online shopping. It's in traffic shopping. 
Now, you could come to Ibadan and say, ah, I'm going to start producing pure water to sell. Except you can replicate the same conditions. She might not succeed at it. So that's why it's important to determine the opportunities. And then once you do that, you must also say what are the threats. Remember I said SWOT. S-W-O-T. The T, threats. What are the things that can destroy this business model? What can happen overnight? Imagine the day Lagos builds the fourth mainland bridge, the day all the waterways is actively and efficiently used, the day the rail lines, and two of them are almost ready to go, the day the rail lines come alive and the waterways begin to run efficiently and fourth mainland bridge is built, traffic congestion in Lagos will drop. When it does, certain opportunities will move. But there would be new kinds of opportunities. Because then, it means that where would people want to sell? At train stations. Because now, people spend time at, they will spend time at train stations waiting for the train. They can buy stuff. At water fronts, where people board the boats, you can literally have everything there for them to buy and take across. There are businesses that exist for a season. Before the Lekki Bridge was built, there was a guy who had a business beside the Oriental Hotel, if you are used to the VI Lekki axis. He had this badge. I don't know if anybody is used to it. He had this badge. You would drive your car in queue because to travel from Lekki into Ikoi, it's like a five, seven minutes drive, but on a bad day traffic, you could be in it for an hour or two. And it was easy to go and queue for his badge. He takes about 20 cars each time, 1,000 naira per car, and the badge will take you across the water. It's literally two minutes or three minutes across the water. It drops you in Ikoi on Queen's Drive, and you drive your car and you get out. For me, that I'm always on the way to the airport, and I never leave home early enough. It was a lifeline. And my husband used to say, how safe are those things? I was willing to be unsafe enough for the time saved. <laughs> so I always took those things. I can't swim, oh. I don't like water. Oh. But you, you hate water. You will not get in the pool. How are you going to? I said, don't worry. She said, I'm sitting in my car. The guy will take you across. But the day Ikoi Bridge was built between Lekki and Ikoi, his business disappeared. That was a threat. But if he recognized the threat or not, it's another thing. But overnight, a government decision wiped out his business. So you must be honest with yourself in terms of considering what are the threats to my business model. And the threat is not the problem. The weaknesses are not the problem. What it does for you, it makes you think ahead. It makes you prefer solutions to those things. It also makes you plan so that it doesn't happen to you overnight. It also makes you decide sometimes that my business model is transient, which means that it's a short-term model. When this time will pass, how will I transit this business to another? It's really important that you think in trying to create business. It's important that you have the humility of spirit to accept opinions that do not necessarily support what you want to do. It's important that you're humble enough to admit weaknesses in your business idea. It's important to admit that what you're thinking might be great, it might be good, but the time and the season that you want to do it is wrong. And therefore, it's a good business idea, but the environment right now does not support it. And it's better to leave that business aside for now. Or start it small to prove. And when you prove it at that stage, you scale it up a little more, and you see what the market response is. I like stage growth in business. Why? Because the factors are always different. 
And if you let your business grow stage by stage, you can adjust the business to the changes in the environment. You can respond to the new issues of growth. You can respond to uh, the failure of your assumptions. Or you can respond to you underestimating your assumption. As in, you might test an opportunity and find that it's bigger than what you thought. And therefore, the business as you are cannot even cope with the opportunity. And you need to scale up much faster. But moving in stages allows you to have a higher chance to survive, for the business to survive. And then you can always find help. There's also the issue of limited resources. You don't have a lot of money. Nobody has all the money they need waiting. So if you start small, you get to see. I'll tell you there's an example of a lady who wanted to start a school. And uh, she, had, she listed a number of us to invest in the school. So I asked her, how much do you need? She said 100 million. So I asked her, how much do you have? She had 5 million. So I said to her, you know, all the people you are talking to, we can give you the 95 million, but you're going to be a slave. Because 5 million out of 100 million, all you can own is 5%. At the most, we give you sweat equity. If you give you 10% or 5% sweat equity, then you will own 10%, but we will own 90%. Even if we gave you 10%, you loan 15%, we will loan 85%. So what does that mean? You will be okay at the beginning because you're excited, you want to get it started. But as the school begins to succeed, and you see the turnover and the money that the school is making, but you see how much of it goes to you, and how much has to go to us, you will despise us. That's natural. That's true. You're going to wake up and think, ah, Amy Denny Moshe will share you and it's my idea, and I'm the one moving it, but this is all I get. So as a rule, I don't invest in anything where the guy who is going to drive it, who has the idea, is going to be miserable at the end of the day. My first rule is to reset so that you have enough stake to keep you happy and inspired to deliver the best in the business. Those are one of my own tests for determining if I invest in anything. So I said to her, bring the business plan. And I broke it down for her. You want to set up a school? Great. Do you fill every classroom on day one? No. Do you need every level? Uh, year one, year two, year three to six. Do you need them all on day one? No. Most likely, you'll have first year, maybe one class of year two, if you can even make a class, and all of that. So why do you want to sell off the shares of the company for money to buy things you do not need today? And so you have empty classrooms with seats, collecting dust. You're waiting for the students to come. Don't forget that from day one, when the students come, they pay school fees. So the school will have cash flow. And you can build within the, sc the school from the cash flow of the school, as in any business. So all she needed was to find what was a startup model of a school. And by the time we were done with the business plan, all she needed was 40 million. Now, her 5 million in 40 million is a different stake, as opposed to her 5 million in 100 million. And then, with equity for her sweat, her idea, and everything, we sat down, broke it down, and I said to her, at the end of the day, let's reserve 40% for you. Your 5 million gives you 12.5%. You get sweat equity of 10. That gives you 22.5. The rest of it you will pay for over time from your earnings and your dividend in the school. Sell these shares, split up in this way to the four people who are going to invest. Together we're more than you, but on your own you're the largest individual shareholder. And you're more comfortable. You know, in this particular real life story I'm telling you, the school will be 10 years on the 6th of December. No, oh, but listen to the story. She died two years after. Two years after she started the school, she had aneurysm. In school, she was having headache, having headache. By the time they took her to the hospital, before they knew what was happening, one, two, three days, she was dead. Her family lives here in Ibadan. And 
She had a dream. She didn't have the capital, but she had a great idea. We've kept the school going. So from maybe like whatever number of students she had then, maybe 60 something or something, the school has 300 and something students, almost 400. We're about to start a permanent site construction within Lekki uh, within the next few weeks because we've bought land, we've gotten approval now and all of that. And her only child that she had, who was in foundation or something, when she died, we have kept our word. She's finished university in England. She's done her master's. She's become a chartered accountant now. Within the period, we paid from the school, even though her dividend could not have covered the expenses. But we knew her biggest dream was for that child to have a certain kind of education. And we decided to keep that dream alive. So all I'm saying to you is, sometimes even the resources, you need to find how you use your smaller resources to achieve the most that you can at a stage and then grow the business from within itself. We've bought, we haven't taken a loan to do anything we've done in the school. So if she's alive, what she wanted to do, trying to raise 100 million, we've done much more. We bought the land in Lekki for way, 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 way more than the 100 million she was looking for. And we're going to build with a lot of money as well. We are going to take some money or contribute some additional money. But all I'm saying is, if you start small and you're disciplined, which is another thing. If you're going to be an entrepreneur and be successful, you are going to be a disciplined human being. Who stays focused on the goal. Which means if you set out to build something... It doesn't matter that you're within the first and second year of the business, you see a lot of cash. It's not available to you. And you see some other confusing opportunities and you get distracted and you move in different areas. People tell me about these multiple streams of income. It's not for you. When you're starting, you have to understand that it's important that you stay focused and establish something. Use your first business to prove your competence. Use your first business to prove that you can be trusted. Use your first business to prove that you're diligent. Use your first business to prove that you can build within. Because the resources of the business, you keep reapplying the profits into the business. I started my business between the ages of 25 and 26. I didn't have any capital. True. So it's not... Because sometimes I hear people say, oh yeah, she succeeded so much because she comes from a very rich family. No, I don't. I come from a middle class family. What do middle class families do? They send you to school and they teach you the uh, the difference between good and evil. They teach you what is right and what is wrong. And they challenge you to go and make something of yourself. That's what my father gave myself and my siblings. A good education, a good foundation in life, and... It gave us the gift of liberty to express ourselves. I believe that's the best thing my father gave me. Because I know at a stage of my business, I took um, a major risk and a major step for a young woman. I took a loan of a million naira in 93. It felt like a hundred million naira as at that moment. I was what, like 30 or 20 something? Yeah, I was like 30. And when my father heard He didn't say to me, don't. I found out later that he said to himself, ah, Mobi, you know. (laughs) But stood back and waited to see. If I got into trouble, he had apparently told his friends he would sell his house and pay off my debt. But he never told me. So he never scared me. He allowed me to try to do these big things I wanted to do. But he had my back. And even I didn't know how much my father had my back. So that gift of liberty to explore. And I challenge the parents in the house. Sometimes your idea and that of your children don't match. But your children are not you. You cannot live the life you didn't live through them. Your missed opportunities or your unfulfilled ambitions should not be forced on your children. Because everybody is different. Everybody is different. 
Your life is different from theirs. Their generation is different from yours. The opportunities that were great in your generation might mean nothing in their generation. And the best thing you can do for a child is to arouse their inquisitiveness, empower them to think, allow them information that allows them to have the ability to crit crit uh, critically think through processes in order to reach conclusions for themselves. Will they fail? Yes, many times. But so what? Failure means nothing. It just means I've tried one thing and I've discovered that it doesn't work that way. But in discovering that it doesn't work that way, I've learned something that I can apply to the next thing that I want to try. It's in that process of trying and applying yourself and setting your own rules, setting your own agenda, setting your own challenges for yourself. That's it's in that process that you discover something outstanding that separates you from the crowd. It's those moments that we become star children for our parents because they allow us to be ourselves. So I plead with the parents in the house, don't judge your children by your time and your season and not by your neighbor's child or your friend's child. Oh, my friend's son, no, listen to his father, see what he's doing, good for him. He might still be doing the same thing when your own child that you thought was slow and unachieving and unserious becomes the superstar that earns 200 times what your friend's child will. This is the truth. It's a different time. It's really, really important that our thinking, we cannot produce anything if we don't have the right mindset. As young people trying to build for the future, you have to think differently. You have to be open to changes. You have to be open to opportunities. You must be willing to try new things. You must be willing to fail what people call, because in my books, I don't know what failure is. I don't call anything failure. I, it's an experiment. I'm, my first degree is in chemistry. And when you walk into a lab, there's no answer. You only walk into a lab with what? Questions. So you make assumptions and you try to prove the assumption to be true or not. And at the end of the day, you write a conclusion. Is it true? It is not. But in the course of it's not being true, this is what I've discovered. That is the perfect formula for life, especially in this generation. The ability and the open-mindedness. It is the perfect ingredient for an entrepreneur. Because some of the biggest opportunities in enterprise will be unprecedented. There will be things nobody has done before. There will be no iPhone and the model of iPhone if Steve Jobs wasn't willing to challenge status quo. There will be no Facebook if Zuckerberg wasn't willing to make assumptions that what he was building that didn't make sense, that did not look like he could make money, will ever become something that will make him one of the richest people in the world. Just think entrepreneurship requires you to think it requires you to challenge status quo it requires you to push the boundary and when everybody says to you it cannot work if there is enough faith in you that there's a chance it will work push until you get to the point where you yourself must be able to say i know that it cannot and you must be honest with yourself when it's not working be honest to say it's not working there's nothing to be ashamed of I'm not afraid to fail at anything by what men call failure. Because I don't call anything failure. But if I try it and it doesn't work, I take something from there and I run. I add it to the next thing and the next thing until I get to destination. Somewhere along the line, I will find the formula that works. And it would take other people a long time to find that formula because it took me many stops to achieve it. That's how stars are made. Discipline. You can't consume what you make. If you set the goal to build this business to this level, that your friend has just bought a new car, that's his problem. It's not yours. Me? I didn't buy... My first brand new car was bought for me by my husband. And it was on my 40th birthday. I'd been in business for 14 to 15 years. And by whatever year, I was already turning over in millions that you could convert to millions of dollars. But my business was capital intensive. My machineries were expensive. Buying a machine was more important than a car. Why? What's a car for? To move me from point A to B. What does a taxi do? 
It moves me from point A to point B. Without any liability. No driver to pay for. No car maintenance. No depreciation. If the car breaks down on the road, I abandon the taxi driver and his car and I take the next one. <laughs> this is exactly what I did. People used to abuse me. You, this is Jabu girl, go and buy a car. I'm like, what's my own Anika? I wasn't stupid and I wasn't caught in the ego of trying to impress anybody. That I drive up and they say, ah, talon, I'm auto, yeah. What's that? A car only takes me from point A to B. It was important to stick to my agenda because a time and a season will come when I can ride any car. And I can't ride any car that I want right now. By the time, by my 40th birthday, the head office of my company, which is in Lekki Phase 1, which when I built and bought land was what? I bought it at 13.2 million. That land today is worth, I don't know, maybe like 300 and something. I built on it 75 million land I'm building. Today, together, it's worth about 800 million. Why am I telling you that? I hadn't bought myself a car when I built that building. I made a choice. I had a business to build. The business required a lot of capital. I was a young girl in business. Banks were not favorable to young people in businesses then. They're better now. You are in a better time and a better season. So don't make excuses. There are loads of grant-like funds, low-cost funds, BOI kinds of money available now. So don't sit thinking, oh, there's no opportunity. No. There's you win that is there. There's end power. There's BOI fund that you can get up to 2.5 million with just your NYC certificate. There are loads of opportunities that exist. There's the Ignite Fund between BOI and First Bank. And there's training added on top of that. There are loads of things available. None of it existed when I started in business. It was a novelty. First, I was a girl. That was just totally out of it. And I wanted to go into manufacturing. That was just unpopular. And it was like you wanted to suffer yourself. But I had gotten into manufacturing by accident. And I decided that once I made the decision to do this, I was going to do it well. And it required things I didn't have on my own. And so it was important to let the business invest in itself. So the luxury of a car was not my priority. I would take any extra money I had and I would buy the next machine that was required. And I would fund the next project because that's where, that's what will generate the returns for me. And building our own showroom or building to house, that was part of creating value for the business. And so I guess my husband just thought, oh my you never for where I'm auto. So my 40th birthday, he bought me what he knew was my dream car. And that was my gift. And it's true because I always measured it in terms of this machine, this machine, machine, this one will buy. And then I think I can, I'm like, give a car dealer this money, nah. But it meant I grew faster than my peers. It meant I built wealth ahead of my peers. It meant that I could move the needle much faster. Ashabi, what do you care? If you've invited me to the wedding and it's not enough that I show up, that if I don't buy the Asha means you don't want me, they'll gladly sleep in my house. True. Stay focused. What is important to you? I will explain to you as my friend. Ma I can't afford this now. I've got to do this. I have salaries to pay at the end of the month. I do this and this. Focus. Why? If you're really my friend, you will support my dream and my ambition. And at the right time, I will do the things I can do with you. Now, even if I know I'm not going to go to the wedding or to go to any function, I'll buy the Ashabi just to show that I support you. I already know I'm not going to go. But it's, it's less story. I just buy it and I keep it. And somewhere, I run a missionary organization. I'll pack all of them to Christian Missionary Fund and give the missionaries as a gift. Yeah. So I'm saying there are seasons in your life. Understand your own seasons. If you want to be successful as an entrepreneur, you must be true to each season. 
The season that you're building from scratch is not the season where you're spending anyhow. That you do a contract and you make money does not mean that money is available to you. Weigh what you have in line with your vision and your ambition. Apply your resources. So sometimes when people say, hey, I cannot find a loan, I cannot do, what have you done with what you have? How have you built from what you have? How have you generated the resources within? How have you applied what is available around you? What I saw as opportunity to start my business was the fact that people pay deposit to order furniture. The carpenter comes with a toolbox, so I didn't need to buy the tools. The big machines were available in the wood market. You could pay for time to use them, the specialists to work the machines. So I would pay for the time. You can rent a spray machine, the compressor and the gun. You didn't need to have money to buy. Find the models within what you want to do that allows you to get started even when you do not have the capital yet. And then as I made money, I bought each thing I was paying to rent, I bought. And that reduced my payout and increased my resources, revenue that was kept in and made us more profitable, a little at a time, stage by stage. By the time the banks opened their eyes and realized where we were, I remember I was already at 150 million turnover. And then the banks will ask you, do you want money? This is the truth. When you show discipline, when you show create value for yourself, but you know the biggest lesson, the process of doing that teaches you to be diligent in managing your resources. And so till tomorrow, as a business, our debt exposure level is always low. Why? I learned to build from within in the times when nobody was going to give us the loan. So even when we were open and money was available to us, we didn't go crazy because it's not free. Don't forget, a loan is not free. It's what you owe plus extra based on what you generate from it or not. So when you're thinking about being an entrepreneur, be smart, be open-minded. Look around you. There is money lying around everywhere in terms of opportunities. There's something that upsets and annoys you and you hate the way they do it every day. But it's not going to change until you pick it up because you saw the problem. How have you solved that problem that you can see? And then you must also know how to price. A lot of people don't know how to price. They price themselves out of the market. People think if their goods are not expensive, then it's not good. That's silly. Just plain stupid. Because you must evaluate your market. What is a real price? Then what is a market acceptable price? And sometimes the real price might be here. The market acceptable price might be here for other factors. Sometimes the real price is here, the market acceptable price is just here. Now, the question is, with this margin, can the business survive? Sometimes no, but sometimes yes. What can turn this small margin into a yes? Volume. It means I must then find if I can sell enough that at this small margin, I will make huge profit. My business model has always been a turnover business, which means I really always want to sell with a small margin, but I want to sell large numbers. I always am looking for the product and the market gap that gives me volume. Why? It's a more sustainable market because your base is wider. You're selling to more people. So if a percentage of that customer base drops off, you still have some. If you have a small market, but high margin, if a percentage of that small market drops off, sometimes your business collapses. That's why you enter some shops. If they see one person enter, they will call for Sonia Day to come and play music. Why? Because the stuff is so expensive, few people ever walk in. And so they sell like three, four times a year because they're waiting for the big margin. But the guy who is selling with five naira, 
and have sold five million pieces has already made far more money than they will ever make. Tell me what Okoya sells. Everything he sells is what? It's kobo kobo. Think. All your biro, all the sleepers, and he's not selling to wealthy people. The pyramid is what contains the people, the population of a nation. The largest number is at the bottom of the pyramid. The pyramid is about your disposable income, what you can afford. The people at the top have the most money. They can pay millions and millions for anything. The people at the bottom are the Kobo Kobo people. But the number makes them more powerful than the people at the top. If you're selling to them. And you're selling enough and consistently. So always think. Don't get caught in this fantasy idea that except every person that is making clothes wants to be a designer, selling, making expensive clothes. If you make up and down for 50,000, 100,000, yeah, I can sew the day that is my 50th birthday or my 40th birthday or my father died. I, my father can only die once. My mother will die once. I will be 40 once, I'll be 50 once. I cannot come and sew all the ashabi you get every week there. But there's somebody else who is sewing 5,000 5, naira. That's every time I say 5,000 last one or 2,000, okay. But he gets 50 pieces a week. 50 times 5,000, 250,000. You charge 50. Only one or two garments a week. What do you make? 100,000. This guy plus X possibilities then you must also understand the market now we're coming out of a recession but what does that mean generally in the country people have reduced buying power what does that mean people who can afford up here before I've dropped here they're looking for alternatives if all your business is based there you've lost market share the guys beneath you will gain from you and then if you are smart no matter what stage you are or what you do, do it well. Why? The cheapest way to advertise is to deliver to a satisfied customer. Your satisfied customer will be your advertisement. They'll tell the next person. My policy as a business person is always encounter us once. My goal is that you will never leave. When the person who used to go here before tries this person because of market reality, then discovers that, ah, why was I paying 50000 before? This guy can deliver quality. Look at what she made for me. Look at what he made for me. Is he going to go back up? Even when the economy picks up, he's not going to go back. Because frankly, at the end of the day, people like value for money. So you need to think about that in your business. Are you delivering value for money? When push comes to push, will your customer know that I'm getting my money's worth? Is there a real reason why they should stick with you? Okay, I'm going to start with questions. No, okay. So just, yeah, I just want to continue with questions. That way I can cover a lot more issues that are specific to you. Yes, sir. Can you take the mic? Thank you, madam. Thank you, sir. I work a lot with young people, and my greatest problem with them is their time management. It's the issue I have with my son, and um, I find that he spends a lot of time enjoying other people's innovativeness. If you enjoy other people's innovativeness, you are doing it at the expense of your own when you are young. When you are like me, it's, up, it's too late to start talking about innovations. So what, what media, when I was young, we had the only red diffusion. Only the volume can be changed, one station, no um, TV. Now we have so many on DSTV. How much time do you use on African Magic, Tribe, and all those channels? 
if you don't think what is the economic benefit or the economic value of how I have spent my time today. When you're sleeping, there is economic benefit. Why? Your body that is well rested allows your brain to function well. And you can apply that brain to thinking right and seeking for solutions that would help you to create economic value. Do you understand? When you're reading a book, you're gaining knowledge. When you are searching for information on, in University of Google and you're getting knowledge that is useful and viable in line with what you seek to do, you are in a process of using your life in a valuable way. But if you decide that, oh, time is not, ah, let me just go and hang out for two hours. Fine, it's not a problem. You just said, let me go and burn two hours of my life. Or let me go and burn my life for two hours. Because your life is equal to time. That's all you have, time. That's why they say someone lived for 80 years. Multiply it by the units of time. That's what he lived for. All God has given you is the day you were born. Have you ever seen a birth certificate? They record the time you were born. You can actually get the totality of your time. And if you die, they record the time of death. There is preciseness to the length of your life. So, take it a bit more seriously. Because you will find that when people will evaluate you, they will look at your attitude to time and to life. So, if other people want to waste their own life, don't let them waste yours. You need to make sure that you are in control of your life. And what is that life? That you are in control of your time. Because your time is your life. Next question. Okay, this is where we blow up. Okay, I'll take the lady there. I'm always passionate. Or partial to the girls. There she is. Yes. Get up. Oh. I like courageous people. Yes, I do. Welcome. Okay. Good evening, everyone. And, okay, my question, Ma, is, you know, I've been wondering how I could um, employ my passion as relating talking to young people and, you know, build a business around that. And, you know, I've not exactly found the correlation, but then I know that any time I hear about entrepreneurship, I'm usually very, you know, eager to attend such meetings. And, you know, while you were talking, I was thinking of a balance. How can I brand myself and, you know, my passion for communicating to young people on career and also build a business around all of that? Now, you know, there are certain measures you guys must also apply. How do you brand yourself as an authority in entrepreneurship when you have no proven track record in entrepreneurship? How do you brand yourself as a career consultant when you have no career experience that empowers you or makes you acceptable to other people to pay you to give them that advice? Do you understand what I'm saying? So you, you must, that, you remember what I said before. In entrepreneurship, there are seasons. So there's a season for you to build. There's a season for you to profit. Now, everything that is your passion is not economically viable for you at a point in time. There are seasons. So when I started at 25, going on 26, if I wanted to gather anybody to talk to them, what will I be talking about? What is it about me that would make them gather in a room like this to come and listen? The only reason you've come today is because I have a proven track record, period. So you need to say to yourself, if this is an interest that I have, what can I do? There might be some other ways, but in the specific area that you want, maybe it's not time yet. So are there other ways I can do this? Yeah. So maybe if I get uh, a station, a radio station, or a TV station to give me airtime, because I have such interest in it, to run, to anchor a program on entrepreneurship. That's not dependent on my skills as an entrepreneur, 
but it's dependent on my interest in entrepreneurship. But I will then get those who have the skills in entrepreneurship to gather together to discuss the issues of entrepreneurship. But because I'm driving it, I'm the face of it or the voice of it, I begin to build myself as a brand in it. And as I'm doing that, I'm gaining knowledge, but I'm also gaining the visibility which is necessary for me to trade, to be a voice. And then get to a point where I can organize entrepreneurship seminars, but I don't have to be the speaker. I'm the face, I'm identified with the topic, I can mobilize the people because you have a following, a followership, and then I can bring the experts and people can pay to attend because they know that in that area, I have interest, I have built a brand, and I can gather the right people together for it, okay? But in the interim, I would, are you working? You are still at school, okay? So even though I'm at school right now, I will read up everything I want to read in that area. I will attend every seminar like this and begin to gain. When I finish school, if I want to go and work, I will get a job and start building a career. And with that, somewhere along the line, I will get, but this is, see, some of the things we want to do, they have time. It's your vision, but it might not be for now. Why? Because you're not ready for it yet. But you can hold it in your heart. I didn't plan to build a business speaking in entrepreneurship. For me, it's not a business. It's social responsibility. I spend so much time on it, sometimes you have to ask, how can it be social responsibility? But for me, it's because of my passion for my country. The reason I do this, the reason I work with a lot of young people specifically, because when she said to me, the young people in our church said, you can't come and preach tomorrow and not have time for the young people. I said, and that they'll see you after. Will you talk to young people? Ah, tomorrow, I'm on the plane to Seattle. So meanwhile, I'm in Ibadan today. Only interest can bring me to Ibadan today because I really was supposed to travel tonight. So, but because she's there to me, I moved it by a day. And then, not just moved it by a day, I then decided, you know what, I'll come in early enough so I can do this. But primarily, doing this today is because my biggest dream is to see Nigeria where it, it can be. It's to see the greatness of Nigeria truly emerge. Now, I do not demand what I do not invest in. And I know that I cannot keep talking and pushing about where I want Nigeria, where I know Nigeria can be, without investing in the process of helping to build. I'm not a politician. I don't want political office. I don't want any of those things. But I want the next 10 million young Nigerians to find themselves and to do great things for Nigeria. And I know that when they do, one point before I die, I will see the true greatness of my country and I will be satisfied. That is why I'm here. So what you have in your heart is for a time and a season, and you will get there. But I like the fire in your heart and that you're thinking about it. But don't jump before time. Because a lot of young people, you guys jump. When you do, you get burnt before time and you get burnt out. Next question. We'll come back to you. Thank you. As a manufacturer, how did Chair Center, or how does Chair Center do uh, the threat of uh, uh, you know, countries like China, who have the infrastructure and the uh, power to bring in some of, uh, let me say, competing products at, at maybe a lesser margin than um, you produce because you know you uh, there is problem with infrastructure in Nigeria. Thank you Okay First and foremost as of today by law in Nigeria, you cannot import whole furniture A lot of people tell people lies about different things So a lot of people get into trouble and they bring the furniture and they get stuck at the portal They have to bribe now, I built my business on the back of two things I was never going to do in my life as a young woman. I was never going to sleep with a man because of business, nor was I ever going to pay a bribe in my business. Why? I'm a Christian. If I'm going to look God in the face, I better be able to stand on his word. And so that's what's ruled my life. Now, in the midst of that, this is my country.
in finding the right sources for your materials as well. In terms of buying raw materials, it's a global market. They can buy in China, I can buy where they can buy too. I can buy in Europe, they can buy, we can buy in different places. So maybe I cannot, the things I cannot even do that is most challenging is that I cannot under invoice and under pay duty and all of the things where they save and translate it back into the business. I cannot do it because of my faith and because I would rather not lose that money. I would rather lose that money than betray God. My choice. Now, I'm going to say this because I'm in a church. And I'm saying this. Your life is not separate from your faith. Your life and your faith are one. You are not schizophrenias. You are one human being accountable to God for the life that you live. Your business life cannot be separate from who you are. So you cannot be a Christian in church on Sunday and be a business person on Monday. I am a Christian that is assigned to the space of business. I am not a business person who is a Christian. The most important thing about who I am is that I am a child of God. But the space of business is my temple. That is my platform. That's where the Lord has called me to. And the assignment of my life is to show that I can succeed to the highest level following the word of God. And I do not have to apologize about it. Now, what does that give me? It gives me the weapon of the word. It gives me the power of the scripture. It allows me to take the most difficult things and go to God and say, Make a way for me where there seems to be none. Show me things that I do not know that will guide me in this. Send me my own customers. Guide the works of my hands. Prosper the works of my hand. Make my Torah margin. Multiply it many times for me to make me more profitable than there are many pounds of profit based on unrighteousness. And of course, I pursue the practical things. I will try to please my customer. I will try to deliver value. I will try to deliver quality. I will push to fight the issues of my cost. I will be responsible in managing my resources. But in this same Nigeria, God has sustained us for almost 30 years. And we have continued. And we've continued to grow. And we have international partners based on the fact that coming into Nigeria, you know that you do not know Nigeria like I do. And for you to succeed in my country, you need me. And therefore, we will have joint venture partnerships with international companies. So all I'm saying is, you will do your homework. You will push every boundary that you can. You will pursue delivering quality, even against the odds. Nigeria has its own pricing mechanism. Because a lot of the uh, factors of production that challenge us are priced. They're priced into our products. And there are also advantages to you producing in Nigeria that the guy producing in China does not have. So if you get into my factory and you say, or you go to any of my showrooms and say, I want to order this chair in yellow. One, I can take the order. Why? It will go straight to my factory and we'll, deliver, we'll produce the one chair for you in yellow and it will come to you. If you want 50 in red, in green, in turquoise, it can come to you. I can customize for your space. If you have this big space and it's an office and you say, I need to seat 50 people in it, what do I need to do? My architects will take the space and they will do the space planning and they will customize the size, size of tables and workstations that will see the number of people that you need to sit in it. The guy who's gone to China to import stuff has brought standard stuff. So he cannot deliver that customization to you. And even if he does, when his goods come, if he gets into the space and the floor is racked here and the wall is not straight here, he already has a problem. I don't. Why? I can make any adjustment from my own factory at any point in time. Time to market. See, when you see the Zenith advert on TV and it shows you all the people, I'm always happy. Why? Every seat they will show inside is from my factory. But Zenith had finished that big high building. Two weeks to the opening of that building, they were looking for 700 seats. That was the first set of seats they wanted for the building. They went to one of my dealers on a Friday. 
They concluded the conversation on the Saturday. They were talking to us behind. The dealer was talking to us behind the scene. Can we deliver this? We said yes. Go on. Keep the conversation on. Close the order. We can back you up. And they were opening in two weeks. By Monday, we started production. By Wednesday, we delivered the first 250. By Friday, we delivered another 50. By middle of the next week, we delivered the balance. They had 700 chairs to open. The guy who is the Chinese guy, who is going to take that order, is going to send the order to China. Apart from the fact that my quality is better than his, he's going to send the order to China. He needs six weeks, at the least four weeks to produce. When he produces in four weeks, how many weeks to ship? From China, it's not two, it's not three. It's four to six weeks. From Europe, it's two to three weeks. So essentially, he needs between eight and 12 weeks. And that's everything working together for eight weeks, possible delays, which is normal, for him to achieve 12 weeks. And sometimes, if he runs into trouble, he's at 16 weeks. I can deliver it in two weeks. And even if I don't have everything that the customer was asking, I don't have the components and everything in the factory I need to bring from my partners out of France, I would always have a starting quantity. Which means I can deliver the first batch to you and say, we will continue to deliver, and I block the order. So, this is my country. That's one. Two, I've got a God that makes all things possible. And I use it. I do not take anything for granted. I dare any situation. Why? Because I always say to God, on account of unrighteousness shall no man take my land. The fact that I'm not willing to do what other people are doing, I will not yield ground. The Bible says, God, God told us in the Bible, challenge me concerning my word. I'm always challenging God. When things change and there's trouble around, I'll say, Father, I know you. You will not put my feet upon this rock and remove the rock from underneath it. There's a reason you set me up in this segment. She will prosper me. What is the problem? Move this mountain. But for every single one of you, no matter how smart you are in business, no matter what you know, no matter how you push the wall, don't ever take for granted the fact that God is on your side. He makes all the difference. God is the one that can make your enemy work for you against his own will. He says, it is the Lord your God that giveth you power upon your hands to make wealth. Why? In fulfillment of the covenant. You are a covenant child. The God factor in your life cannot be taken out. I testify to you today that everything about my life, and I wasn't born a Christian. I come from a Muslim home. My great-grandfather was the first Elijah in this city of Ibadan. If you know anything, if you go to Ibadan, the, the real Ibadan, and you ask about Ileo Nishinio, go and find out. That's my, my grandmother's father. So my name at birth is Belkisu. So there's no confusion about what I'm telling you. So the, some of you were born Christians. You're used to it, so you take it for granted. So your Christianity is for fashion. It's to write on the form, religion, Christian. What does that mean? Your Christianity is your life. And it is your power to do great things. You can stand against everything that will stand against you, understanding that the force of the power of God can move any mountain. And if you want to build a business, look, everything you know today is not sufficient to tell you about what tomorrow will be. But who is the God that knows today and knows tomorrow? It's Jehovah. That is why when you're taking a decision about business, it's always a choice. The Bible says you will hear a voice telling you which way to go, whether to turn to the left or to turn to the right, that you might walk in it. The Bible says the land shall fall onto you in pleasant places. It means you'll be at the right place at the right time, meet the right people along the path of your life. Who you meet today, not knowing who they are, not knowing who they will become, but you treat every human being right with respect and love and honor. Because God expects you to do that. But somewhere along the line, somewhere else, God will turn them into an asset in your life. It's not about how smart you are. You should apply all the talent you have, your smartness, your whatever, your energy, apply it. Because the Bible says, haven't done all. Stand and see the salvation of God. It is that salvation of God that makes an ordinary man into an extraordinary man. So don't go thinking 
you are about, you can do what you seek to do without God. Because ultimately, the challenges of life will overwhelm you. Some have everything you could ever imagine. Their father is rich. They have land houses. They've given them all the resources. But it's all added up to zero. Some have nothing except God. But somewhere along the line, one has added to one to make it two. For another season, it added to another two. It became four. And somewhere after the four, they, it added to a six that made it into ten. And before you know it, they're sitting at 50. When you have options in life, one option can seem right. The Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto men. And at the end of it, there's destruction. One business today that seems like this is the one that will win might actually not last anything for any length of time. Another that looks stupid. This is why you can't, it cannot be about just what people say. You need to seek the face of God. You think I ever sat down and wanted to be in furniture manufacturing? Hell no. Never did. I went to school thinking first I wanted to be a doctor. Then I changed my mind because of real dead bodies and decided I wanted to be a lawyer. And then I decided no. That, okay, I'll finish this chemistry, but I want to be a chartered accountant so I can go and work in a bank. I finished, went to serve in an accounting firm, Deloitte, and thought, once I finish, I would, uh, I would become chartered and I would get a job in a bank. By the end of my youth service at Deloitte, I thought, I hate this. It's boring. Nothing to challenge my mind. And then I left it and went home. and just wanted to find any job to keep myself busy, still wanting to work in a bank. The first job I found one week after my youth service was in a furniture company. I went there just to kill time. It was not my desire, my dream. Never even thought about it. Never thought about manufacturing. But I got there. I only lasted three and a half months. The steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. I only lasted three and a half months. But I discovered why there was a desire in me to study architecture at a point in time along the line. I was good in art, but I was very good in science. So everybody sentenced me to science. But in that place, I saw the creative part of me fully come alive. But I hated their value system as a company. And I was young and free. I lived in my father's house. There was always food to eat, so I didn't care about the risk. And I thought, I can do what they do here and do it well, and do it with a different set of values. So I left and thought to go and start my own company. People always ask me now, didn't you think about failing? It didn't even occur to me. See, that's the benefit of youth. You can take any risk at this stage. Even if it doesn't work out, you learn something and you move on. Don't be afraid to try new things. Don't be afraid to your parents, let them try. My father let me try. He did. He let me free. Like I said, was watching my back, but he let me try. My first work was done at the back of my father's house. There's the main house, there's a house behind, in between, was where my upholsterer was sitting and reupholstering my first upholstery job, which was my youngest sister's uh, friend's parents, their sofa. My upholsterer was doing it there. And my first carpentry work was in an uncompleted building next to my chief carpenter's house. That's where we started. What became a multi-billion Naira in business. That's how it started. Did I have any money? No. I told you, when you make the first order, you pay a deposit. So their deposit was my first capital. But I stuck with it. And I got encouragement along the way to dare to dream and to push the boundary. But I didn't know people were watching me. Because I did those things with the fear of God. I committed to my business with everything I had. But I also committed to live according to God's word. And so my value systems were clear. I will not do certain things. Well, was it easy? No. There were many painful days. But I knew God is who he says that he is. I knew that God is faithful. And that he was going to reward me for faithfulness to his word. And I stuck with it. People thought I was crazy. Sometimes even my own staff would tell me. Babe. Are you sure we're making money with all this kind of value system? My sister said to me the day I was appointed to the board of First Bangra, you know that she used to sit down and say, Mama Rupala, she do me. 
Maybe because tea is important. Why do you want everything to be black or white? Why do you insist on doing things the difficult way? It wasn't the difficult way. It was the God way. But the world will tell you that you're choosing to do it in a way that is not acceptable. And they'll call you a fool. The Bible says, with the foolish things of this world, without confound the wise. So I'm happy to be foolish. But foolish in his hand. So I'm saying to you, if you really want to succeed, I can teach you all the things. You will learn a lot of stuff. But let me tell you now, you cannot take God outside of what you want to do. And you cannot take your loyalty and your dedication to God because he is the one that makes a way where there seems to be no way. He's the one that will show you the opportunities and guide your hands to take it. He's the one that will line your path with the right network at different points in time. And you will harvest in places you have not sown. But as it is, here I am. I didn't get here by accident. It took the grace of God, his mercy, and my willingness to follow him. So everything you will learn about entrepreneurship is good. But you're already privileged if you're a child of God. You need to combine the two for you to prosper. Except the Lord builds a house, the labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord watches over a city, you stay awake for nothing. I have seen many hard-working people, but it's amounted to nothing. You want to see the people that really work? Go to a construction site and see the man who carries Kwan Kwan on his head up and down all day long on 1,500 or 2,500 naira a day. If I sit in a meeting for a day, I don't want to tell you what I will earn. That's the truth. So I'm saying to you, Set your heart, learn all that you can. What you seek, lay at the feet of the Lord and ask him for help. When in 2004, government banned furniture, what we were doing as at that moment, from full local production, we are transited to producing in OEM companies abroad, five countries, and we bring all the parts in and we will create our collection. But when that happened, everybody was worried for me. And I'm like, no. All I wanted was for God to guide me. But that's what led to Sokwa. That's what led to my FMM factory. That's what led to many things. It was that whole process that brought me in the view of many. Because I transited that process without compromise. And ultimately... It was, we became a bigger company and better for it. So, things will change around you, but don't let who you are and whose you are change. You will always find your way. Thank you. Next question. Oh, I promise, I'll come back to you, but I promise that gentleman I'll come to him. Yes, I'll come to you next, okay? Thank you. Um, you spoke about building from within, but at the same time, when you get to a particular stage, you mentioned growing in stages. When you get to a particular stage, you are going to need to invest. You mentioned Empower, you mentioned UN. How does someone know when they are at that particular stage? Because one of the things that young people, young entrepreneurs are worried about is going to get maybe like a loan or whatever from a bank because we don't want to be stuck or we don't want to believe that we're going to be able to reach something and won't be able to reach it. So how do we know when or how do we leverage it? Well, it, I mean, it's your call. And what you talk about, oh, not wanting to get stuck, as in get stuck with a loan. Well, that's your risk factor in business. You know, in life, you take a risk. And you have to believe in what you're doing enough to be willing to take a risk for it. And you are the one that will know when you're there. I told you about that, my one million naira loan. How did I get there? We were producing, we were getting orders, but we were working so hard, my carpenters and I, 
We'll work from morning till night. Sometimes we'll do night shift. And we couldn't meet the orders. We weren't delivering um, as efficiently as I'd like to. Sometimes we'll walk through the night. If it happens to rain, the, all the spraying and everything will not dry well. It will mildew and it will change. We'll have to start all over. We're, we're having a lot of disappointed customers and I found that very frustrating and unfulfilling. At that point, I was desperate. I wanted to do anything to move my business to the next level because I knew that it was either that or the business would die because you cannot continue to have unsatisfied customer back to back. It wasn't because I didn't know what to do. It wasn't because we weren't working hard. It was just we didn't have enough to do what we needed to do. So, in fact, what happened in my case was I had this customer. He has three daughters. But because I was a girl, or I'm, I'm still a girl, because he saw that I'm a girl, you know, the guy took to me because he always thought, how can a young girl, you know, be so dedicated, doing what you're doing and all of that. So I became his first daughter, as he used to say. And, you know, I became close to him and his wife because he always used me as an example for his three daughters. And he saw me one day, I was doing some work for their company, and he saw me, I was pregnant, but I was miserable. And he thought, come, 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 follow me to my office. I said, sir, why, why, why do you look so sad? You're not yourself today. And I said, the truth is, I'm really frustrated with my business. No matter how hard I work, I cannot make my customers happy. We do this, we do that. And he said, what will you need to change it? And I said to him, if I had a million naira to buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this, I will do what I need to do. But who is going to give it to me? I was a 29, no, I was 30 at that point. Who is going to give me? This was 93. And the guy said, now, let me make a point. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it well. Wherever you find yourself, leave a legacy of a good name and of reliability. This guy didn't know me from Adam other than from my work. That's how he met me. But he knew that I was dedicated to my trade and my business was, I was serious about my business. So he said to me, you know what? I can give you the one million naira. I almost passed out. He said, but... You will find me a finance company that I will give the money to as a deposit. They will issue it to you as a loan, but they will owe me the money. You will pay them and pay them the interest every 90 days. They will pay me what is due to me every 90 days to guarantee that he got his money at the end of the day. He still secured his money, but he gave me a chance. Now, was it going to be expensive money? Yes. Finance house money is never cheap. But I was ready to take any risk at that point. Why? I believed in my business. And I believed I could make it work. And I wanted to challenge myself in order to take the next, to go to the next level. So, luckily for me, there was a finance house where every time I was desperate for cash for the business, in terms of I had a job to do, we didn't have enough money to finish it, I would go and take 30 days money from them make sure we finish the job on time so I could try and collect my money and I always went to pay back. When I needed to buy a generator, I took a quick loan from them, made sure that all the money for every job we did then, I went to pay them back. I needed to buy a truck, I took finance house money to buy a truck. That's what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make is if you believe in your vision, if you believe in your business and you know that you're throwing everything at it, you will take some risk on it. So these guys, I had a good record with them. So when he gave me that opportunity, that opportunity would have been lost if I hadn't built a good record in a finance company. If I was taking money from a finance house and I destroyed my reputation there by not keeping my word, I would have nowhere to go. So I went to them and they said, of course, we know you will pay. Why? Because I always paid theirs. So I linked the two. He gave them the money, they gave me the money. I worked for that guy for 15 months. That's the only way I could put it. Because it turned out for me, unfortunately, to be in 1993, when the finance market went crazy. Interest rates went between 40 to 72%. Yes, it was madness. But I had had a chance to try to do what I had to do, but had no other way to do it. And I worked hard. 
by using the money to buy all the machines I could buy and moved us to a bigger factory space and all of that, I was then able to seek bigger jobs. And in that process, I got one particular job that was a breakthrough job for us. And when I finished that job, it was the proudest moment for me because it was one of those projects. I don't know if anybody knows the Ali Button building in Victoria Island. But it was that building then. Ventures and Trust was the one that built it. That was their office. They, it was like the best thing that happened in Lagos then. You know, they, the Ventures and Trust guys were like in their late 30s, early 40s. They were front runners for their generation. They had this new big fancy office. And I fought, went there every day until it was like the woman and the judge. Until they gave me this job. And I knew that I could not fail at it. When I finished and they paid the balance. I went to the financer and said, how much is the money that is left? 15 months, I still had 942,000 to pay. Because of interest of between 40 and 72%, it was fluctuating month to month. But all the money they had finished paying me for the job was about that. I gladly paid it off, had no money, but had a factory and all the machine was mine and no debt. Now, do I hate the man who was collecting interest of the company? They gave me an opportunity of a lifetime. I created value by staying committed to it. I fought to get jobs and to do the work then, and it moved me to another level. Two, that Ventures and Trust job, the day they were opening it, it was a big ceremony, and then it was my proudest moment. I just had Olu Dollar. I was, they had all these people lined up. That's my first son. All the, the architect, the structural engineer did this, and at the end of it was this slim, Jandala young girl. I was about 29, and I just had a baby, and they said, oh, and the furnishing of this building was done by QBs. That was the name of my company at that stage. And there was me, proudly looking around. But what do you think happened? All the big people that they invited there for the opening saw who did the job. What will happen? My phone will start ringing. And it did. So all I'm saying is this. You will know the moment. You, you will know if you're willing to make that sacrifice. You know, if you're still playing safe, then you will stay mediocre. And you know, the thing about things that don't grow, so you either grow or you what? Or you die. That's the truth. Because there's no stagnation in life. You cannot remain stagnant in life. So think, do the best work you can with what you're doing, but determine where you want to go to, and you must be able to see it. You must be able to see it enough to be willing to pay the price for it. I didn't think about failing. I thought about what I could make out of it. There are always two sides to a coin. If I focus on the failing, I'll be afraid to take a one million. My father had never taken a one million naira loan in his life. And like I said, my father said, well, be, you know, and just sat back and was waiting to sell his house and pay the debt. But did he have to sell his house? No. He's never had to sell his house on account of me. And I have only moved forward. So, yeah, things happen. Thank you very much, Ma. Good evening, everybody. Like you said, um, you are into manufacturing of something. Likewise, me, I'm or something. into... something. The something oh, is manufacturing. Sure. <laughs> Likewise, me, I'm into manufacturing of building paint that I do myself. I have this challenge that when you go to sites to get work, they will tell you you have to be in a symbiosis relationship with them before you can get one contract or the other. You have to be in a what? Symbiosis relationship. That's the term they actually use for me. Which... Uh, symbiotic means win-win. Win-win. Some of them will actually tell you they have to date you. You have to do some things before they can give you that contract. Mm. So I want to know how you were able to, at a tender age of your business, how you went through that. And the second question is, as um, my business, there is an intermediary, which is the painter that paints on the wall. They always expect you to give them returns because they expect they are to get the paint themselves. But maybe the... Producer, um, the person in charge of the project, they actually win the person over and you supply the paint to the person. They always expect you to give them returns. 
And if you don't, they will start telling the person that, okay, this paint is not good, this paint is giving them problem, or because you are not willing to give them anything, because you believe you've done your part, and you've did everything, if I, you, you've done it so well. So how do you do about that? Because you're also someone that you think you don't want to bribe anybody to get to the top. And these are the intermediary that says a lot about your brand. How do you go about that? Now, let me get, no, hold your mic. Do you sell paint or do you take painting contracts? I sell paint and I take painting contracts too. So they're two separate things. Yes, sir. So where you're selling the paint, that's one transaction. Yeah. It's just a transaction. Where you take the painting contract, it means you're supplying the painter, the paint, and the work. All right. Yes, no. Now, so the guys who work for you as painters on a painting contract, you are the one who choose them. You choose them, right? Yes. So if you, someone, before you choose someone to work with, you have to know that they are reliable, they can be trusted, and they've got your back. So your first job is to find the right kind of partnerships. That's one. So it's not just about any painter. It's about a painter that you can trust, that you can work with. And then when you get the paint, are you buying from the paint test shop or are you buying from paint manufacturing factories? I manufacture myself. I get the raw materials. Okay, so you I produce, produce the paint. Yes, okay, ma'am. fine. So, so, so that's good. Now, if you go back to the people that want to sleep with you, do you want to sleep with anybody? No. Good. So there's nothing to discuss there. Now, when... When I say there's nothing to discuss, I mean that it starts from what you want and what you don't want. Once you're clear about what you don't want, you learn to turn the people who want to demand it into fools. I'll explain what I mean by you turn them into fools. Because wisdom is the principal thing. First, start the work. Start the jobs by looking for jobs in what I call your low-hanging fruit, your uncle, your auntie, your father's friend, um, your friend's father, people that can give you a chance to show the quality of your work. All right? You push for those areas. Don't go first to areas where you have higher exposure. Do you understand? Now, when you do those ones, there's at least one person that will see what you've done. Do you understand? And they will recommend you to them. And that helps. And when you get to someone and the person is saying, hey, let's do symbiotic relationship. Do you know how to kneel down for a person, somebody? Eh? So you will kneel down and say, hey, your sir. You, the sir will not finish you. Come, come out. <laughs> so, it's not you. <laughs> so he's sitting there and uh, Thank you, man. But it's not you. You understand? <laughs> so he's sitting there and he says, hey, ah, young lady, oh yeah, your paint is good, blah, 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 blah. You know, and you're saying, sir, if you give me a chance, I can deliver on this job and all of that. He says, hey, ah. and he says, okay, that's very good, but hmm, fine girl. And you say, ah, excuse me, sir. The sir will not drop oh. And then when he says, uh, uh, what's wrong with you? You're a big girl. Let's do Go on your knees. <laughs> Say, hey, John, to real long, sir. Shemo, I respect you. You are like a father. Say, I'm not your father. You are like my father. <laughs> you are like my father. I'm just trying to make a living. I'm trying to do this job. I'm trying to look for opportunities. I will deliver the job and I will make you happy, sir. But I cannot do what you say. You know, this God that lives in the heavens, he will judge you and I. I'm sure you don't want God to judge you. You will get up, oh. You will, be, you will still be begging him. He will sit there. You're not going to say, what do you mean? Go to hell. There will be many go to hells. Because there are too many men who are in trouble. And as you can see, if you're watching CNN now, it's the season of the troubles for men like that. And many of them will rot in hell. There's no problem about it. Because they're destroying the lives of many young people. No, no, it's true. There's a, you know what? The worst things of this world, some of the most powerful men in the world, their day and season has come. 
in the last three, four weeks, do you know how many massive, mighty men around the world have lost their position, their career, and everything because of this thing that we're talking about? You will kneel down there, and by the time you finish, the guy is the one that will not beg you. Because you will not get up. You will not leave his office. Somebody is going to try and enter his office. They're going to ask him why you are begging him. Do you understand? And if he says, okay, my lord, uh, by the time you say, ah, me only love it, for me, shall. Remember that woman and the judge. By the time she finished with the judge, he gave her justice. Look, what you will not do, you must never do. But what you want out of life, you must fight for. Before, there was a point where I used to say, I will not pay bribe and I don't care if I lose the job. That was my attitude as I was trying to express my no bribe, no sleeping with men. Then, stand up, sorry. Then Pastor Bimbo Odukoya of blessed memory. One day she looked at himself as blessing. Look, in fact, it's not, I will not pay bribe and I, and I don't care if I lose the job. She said, no, I will not pay bribe and I will not lose the job. So I thought, eh, okay. So we turned the table around. And I remember there was one particular project that was really a massive project. In our, we, you know all those security doors you see at the entrance of the banks? That's us as well. It's a major part of my business, and we've been doing it for about 23 years. I have a factory in Italy that produces that. And we had a particular bank that the family has lost the bank now. They had to, because unrighteousness will destroy a nation. You know, as the Bible says, sin will bring reproach. And with that reproach is destruction. The guy said, blah, blah, blah. And my staff said, in our company, we don't do this. So when she comes, I said, why are you calling me? Answer him now. You know the answer. So she said, well, I told him that we cannot do it, and that's it. But between, I was in America when she called me. Between that day and the next morning, I was angry in my spirit. And I got up and I said, what am I even talking about? Why would I lose a 750 million job because somebody else wants to do what is then I said on account of unrighteousness shall no man take my land so I changed the prayer and started praying father I take this job within 24 hours they called back and said even though all the other people are willing to do what you say you will not do what I've been told is is only your product that can survive in the areas that we need to put it so we didn't pay the bribe but we got the job because we were willing to fight for it you will also lose many, but it's fine. Do you understand? You will do everything. The Bible says, having done all, you will stand and see the salvation of the Lord. You will beg, you will plead, and if the man is cursed, you will not answer. But you will walk away, leaving your righteousness behind and judgment upon him, because you will go to the next place. But remember what I talked about prayer. You will prayerfully still be asking God to line your path with helpers. He will order your steps to places where you will find favor. You will lose some, it will not matter, but you will not give up on it. And as you get the opportunities, you will make the most of it. And everyone that you do well will earn you another. Do you understand? And you will continue to build. Now, to build righteously is not an easy journey. But the Bible says in the world you will do what? You will see troubles. But he says you are an overcomer. But those that are willing to wait for God will not have to wait forever. I can tell you that. So, don't give up on it. Make sure your product is the best. Work in the best way to deliver the right product. Look for your low-hanging fruits. Go to primary schools, to small schools, to small houses, to your uncle's house, start building up the ladder. When the son talked about, do not despise the days of humble beginnings, he knew what he was talking about. Because there's less competition and attention at that level. But by the time you gather enough of the small jobs together, they can become big in volume. You're a young, beautiful girl. When I started, I was very slim and like, wow. Short skirts, nice shirts, flat shoes, briefcase. But I used to have a face that would tell you, dare me and I will deal with you. (laughs) But I will fight for my work. And I used to make sure that by the time I'm done, you cannot ignore the work I've done. And that, plus being a girl, you're a girl selling paint, producing paint, that's a novelty. That worked for me as a novelty. 
because there were few girls in furniture manufacturing. And he said, who made your furniture? One girl. Didn't care if you call me one girl or one boy. Just give me the job. And I continue. And it started with my Remember, the Bumioni crisis. So they had, they brought some British uh, executives out of retirement into Cadbury, Nigeria, got them to rebuild the company here, and their last assignment was to find what they called a board of integrity in Nigeria. So they said they identified six people that they could trust, and they wrote the list of um, certain criteria that must be met. And they told the people to come up with names. They came up with 30 names. Somehow, I got on that list. I have no clue who wrote it there. And they whittled from 30 to 8. From 8, they whittled to 6. I was still there. I didn't know anything that was going on. By the time they were at six, they, start, they, they started making calls to pay a visit to those six people. So I got a call uh, by a friend of mine 
who was the MD of Accenture then. And she said, some people would like to see you, but I was traveling the next day. So I said to her, I'm traveling tomorrow. If they can see me tomorrow morning before I travel at night, that would be fine. So she said, okay. So the next day, these two British guys came to my house. And for the next two and a half hours, we had a chat. They asked me every question under the sky. And I answered. I asked them all my own questions too. And we finished it. And they asked me, if we asked you to join the board of Cadbury, would you consider it? I said, if only to redeem the name of my country from the shame we had suffered because of the Bumi Onisaga, that I will do it for nothing. To show you that there are many credible Nigerians. So they went away. And I think about a few weeks after, they called and asked for my CV. I hadn't even prepared a CV for years because I'd been self-employed. So I asked my friend who does it every day to say, okay, fine. Can you try and put this together for me? So I sent it to them and I forgot about it. This was February. This process went on, I think, till about June. I had another conversation or something. And then by August, I was on holidays in America when I got a call of them saying, would you join our board now? And I'm like, I'm already out of the country. I'm on holidays, so I can't do it now. So as it happened, from the six, they chose three. And the three were myself, Dotun Sulaiman, and Atedo Peter side. And so Dotu and Atedo joined August 21st or something, but I was away. So I couldn't join till the next board meeting, which was October 21. So they, they're like two months ahead of me on the board. And then I joined the board. So the things I did because of God, the value system that I held, my commitment and dedication to building was noticed. And when it mattered... That's what got me on the board of Calvary. Now, the thing about corporate work is this. When you suddenly move out of the blues onto a board like Cadbury, people will notice. Why? Cadbury is a global company. Their assessment process is very thorough. It's not man, no man, because I didn't know anybody. Until tomorrow, I don't know who their six people were. I don't know who were the people that were involved for recommending. Absolutely no clue. So what will then happen is other people will begin to look at you closely. Because if it's like a validation. And this is part of where God comes into play. Because God will cause attention on you in a way. Because like I said, I don't know who got me on that list in the first place. Now, the next major board I joined after that, of course, I was on some not-for-profit boards, Convention on Business Integrity, but those were, I'm on a board of Convention on Business Integrity with Dr. Kolade as chairman then, and then Professor Oshibajo became the next chairman. Why? Because of my commitment to doing things right. So it was my value system that made me work on that board, but that was not a corporate board. It was a not-for-profit board. Now, the next thing was, First Bank as a group was going into a joint venture with um, Sanlam. Sanlam is the second largest financial services company in South Africa. And together, they were setting up an insurance company, which was going to be a startup insurance. So first, um, FBN Insurance. F then they were starting FBN Life Assurance. It was a startup company. And they were looking for Someone who knew how to drive a startup, but who also had good international partnership experience. Now, in 2004, when government banned furniture, my response was not to smuggle. That was the response of a lot of my competitors. My response was to find a legal solution. And that legal solution led to my joint venture partnership with Sokwa of France. And Sokwa is the largest office furniture manufacturing company in France. And we, I approached them. We joined together to set up Sokwa Chair Center in Nigeria. That caught the attention of people. But it also showed I could work across borders with global companies and create a company successfully to deliver. 
So when they had a situation that mirrored my experience and they were looking for someone that had the combined skills, I fitted the bill. And so they headhunted me for that. Now, of course, when people are headhunting, there's always someone who knows you, someone who knows your antecedents, someone who knows your value system. That's why every opportunity you have, you have to do things right. You have to be conscious of how you do things, what you do, because there are people watching you. And at that point, I was invited to meet the group chairman then and asked me to chair the insurance company. In fact, my first answer was me, chair an insurance company. I don't know anything about insurance. What am I going to do? That? I can't do that. And he said, insurance is the product. The insurance experts will be with you on the board. But what is important is you know how to build from scratch. Two, you know how to manage international joint ventures. We need those skills in order to get this done. And that's why we want you to do this. I told him two things I need to do. I need to go and pray because something I hadn't done before. I would need a gun. And it wasn't, they weren't asking me to sit on the board. They were asking me to chair the board. So I'm like, how? If you ask me to even sit on the board, I would just sit amongst the people and contribute my own. He said, no. I said, okay, I need to go and pray. And I need to go home and speak to my husband. So I went away. After some time, I came back to him and said, you know, I've prayed. I've spoken to my husband. He's encouraged me. My closest friend also encouraged me, assured me, you can do this. For you, it's nothing. And all of that. And that you're also a very shrewd and smart businessman. If you actually think I can do this, I see it as a challenge. I love challenges and I'm willing to take the challenge. So it will not always be comfortable. Sometimes you will step out into what you're not sure of, but you're going to throw all that you have at it to make a success of it. So I took that assignment. No, I committed to take the assignment. But what I did not know is that I could not chair the board of that company if I didn't sit on the board of the bank. And they didn't tell me that literally it was an interview to sit on the board of the bank and then to chair the board of that company. So I, I knew nothing. I knew nothing. I just thought, okay, that's it. And one month after, one day, I traveled, came back, had a long day, my phone battery died. I plugged it in. It came on and it was beeping a lot of messages. I wanted to get into bed, but the Holy Spirit said, pick up your phone. So I picked up my phone. And the first message I saw was from um, one of the directors of First Bank. And he sent a message and said, congratulations, you've just been appointed to the board of First Bank. And I thought, what's he talking about? So I took the phone to my husband. And I said, kakini. Because I was confused. And he read it. And said, ah, but that's not what you told me. I said, that's not what they told me. What they told me is what I told you. So he said, okay, call them. So I picked the phone, called the person who sent me the text. He was in London about to board a flight. And he said, where have you been all day? Everybody's been calling you. So I explained to him how my day had been. He said, congratulations. I said, congratulations. Well, I don't understand what you sent to me. He said, ah. Aren't I on the board? Wasn't I there? Your CV was presented today. The whole board discussed it and you were approved to sit on. I'm like, how? He said, forget the story. Bottom line is, it's you. And that is true. Ugh. So I picked my phone and called the chairman that interviewed me. And as he picked the phone, he said, my director. I just started laughing because I didn't know what else to do. So I said, but sir, that's not what you told me. So he laughed and said, who do you know that if they tell come and sit on the board of First Bank, that will not say yes? That's so, you test people's heart. That that's how these things are done. You test their heart and their intent in order for you to find the right talents for the house. Let me tell you something. No matter who you know, if you don't know the job, even if you get there, you will not last. But more importantly is, if you're good at what you do and you display dedication, integrity, and diligence, doors will open for you. And it will not even be about who you know. And one thing I remember this chairman told me, he told me one day, he said, you know, I get a lot of CVs, people left, right, and center, telling me, ah, 
uh, brother, uh, consider me for any of your boards and stuff like that. He said, and there are many competent people, but the real challenge are people with integrity and character, that that is what is cursed. As Christians, we should naturally fit the bill. We should naturally be people of character and integrity. But many times, we also drop the ball. And that makes it difficult for those opportunities. So I joined the board uh, October. My first board meeting was December 2010. And by March of 2011, they now appointed me to chair the board of the insurance company. Now, I went to something I didn't know at all. But I went with what I knew. And they had a business plan that said that they will make profit in about five years. I did everything the way I knew I would do my own business. Without the fat of a large organization. In two years, we were a profitable company. That caught their attention. When you get an opportunity, what do you do with it? So I got an unusual opportunity. And I delivered value on it. And it couldn't be ignored. And what then happened? They moved me from there to chair the board of the investment bank. Did I have investment banking experience? No. I delivered on the first assignment. They were sure I would deliver on that. And I went with the same mindset. And for three years, I worked with the team there. Within that period, we bought Kakawa discounters, and they asked me to double chair Kakawa and FBN Capital. And we combined the two at the end to create, in 2015, October or so, to create what is FBN Merchant Bank today. So I chaired the Merchant Bank till December. But by September of that year, they had decided to change the leadership at the Commercial Bank. And I was appointed as the chair of the Commercial Bank, which I started effectively 1st of January last year. On the outside, it looked like it was just some random thing. Or oh, somebody somewhere just did this. See, there are people that the Lord will line your life with, but you're going to have to show up. You first have to prove you can be trusted and you can deliver. And you can deliver value. Why? You're on display for everybody to see. If I can't deliver on this assignment, everybody will see it. And that's what keeps me awake at night. That I bear three banners there. My father's name, my husband's family name, and the name of the Lord Jesus. All three I took there with honor. All three I must take out of there with honor and dignity. And yet, I must leave a legacy of performance. So all I can say is this. Whatever you are doing now, be the best at it. Also, treat human beings like the gold and diamond. Every human being you have a chance to come in contact with, treat them well. You never know who is going to speak for you or speak against you somewhere tomorrow. That's my story. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, can you please appreciate Mrs. Ibukwa Oshika?